When I'm looking at this business as a whole, what we are, Twitter Creek Gardens, nine acres of land situated on the south side of Lookout Mountain, outside of Homer, Alaska, I'm looking at a bigger picture than just a farming business. I feel like we essentially have been gifted this land. It really fell into my lap in this really magical way, and it's a huge gift to have the opportunity to work with a piece of land and try to make a living off of it. When I'm thinking about that, I have to think of the whole picture. We are on a south slope. Right below our slope, we have springs that are going right into a creek, which is a tributary to the Anger River. We're dealing with salmon habitat, all kinds of habitat. It's important to me to make sure that we are keeping all of those natural systems in mind while we're trying to grow food on this plot of land. So all the way down to the microbial life in the soil, we are fostering natural growth and making sure that we are contributing instead of extracting. We call ourselves a biointensive market garden and the term biointensive is referring to high yields in a small amount of space. And the key to having high yields in a small amount of growing space is having very nutrient dense soils. We are using a broad fork instead of a rototiller. We are adding compost and natural amendments instead of using chemical fertilizers. And we are feeding the life in the soil, which feeds the life in our vegetables. The key to biointensive farming is having really, really healthy soils and whatever we can do to contribute to that and foster the naturally occurring process that already exists. I grew up in a nice little neighborhood right outside Fairbanks behind the college. Rolling hills and beautiful dirt roads not so much farming. We had a yard and we had a little garden out back occasionally, but my neighbor had one and I remember what it was like to go down there and try carrots straight out of the ground and pick peas right off the vine and what that flavor was like. We grew up with this couple, um, Clarence and Pearl Sandberg, and Clarence always kept this immaculate yard. He had beautiful flowers and a beautiful vegetable garden. And when he passed away, his wife Pearl wanted to continue beautifying her yard. So not knowing anything, she hired me. And it was such a special time to be able to have an 84 year old mentor at 19 years old at such a influential age and, and spend quality time with someone of that age, teaching me something that become, has become incredibly valuable in my life. but I had this dream of living in Homer and living on the water and being able to harvest my own seafood. And, you know, being landlocked, born and raised in Fairbanks, there was just a real draw to live near the ocean for many reasons. But definitely one of them was, was being able to wild harvest my own seafood. I came to Homer with $50 in my pocket, you know, 24 years old and a truck and a dog. Kind of did the school of hard knocks and was like, well, I want to farm, so I had, I have really generous friends that have a beautiful bench lot here in Homer. I put a thousand square foot garden in their front yard and sold four CSA shares and went to my first farmer's market with maybe five bundles of herbs and this like umbrella and a tiny little table. And it's like, this is, <laughs> this is how I'm gonna start. Very naive, very romanticized vision, but was able to find land finally after two years of searching up here on Lookout Mountain, the south side of Lookout Mountain. Then I came here and stuck a spade in the soil and pulled it out and in my hand there was 40 earthworms in just the blackest most beautiful soil that looked like chocolate cake batter and and there's these fresh springs running through and on this south sloping field and and I just was like I could I can farm this. I can totally farm this. The next spring, I put in maybe a quarter acre of garden. 
and sold eight CSA shares and went to the farmer's market with five bundles of herbs and a couple heads of broccoli and just kind of started my way. We had to build everything literally from the ground up and I, and I think that's another aspect of being a last frontier farmer that isn't always considered when researching examples of other farmers. There's so much farmland out there, especially in this country, that a lot of beginning farmers can walk in to infrastructure that's already in place. So that's also something that I didn't consider how I needed a house, you need a greenhouse, you need really to extend seasons, you need high tunnels, you need to develop the water source, you need a, if you're gonna have plumbing, you need a septic system, uh, you need water drainage. That was 2005, it's 2021, so I'm 16 years into this project. And just now I feel like the infrastructure's in place. And it took all of that time and all of that investment with many different loan sources to be able to accomplish that. So we've only turned a profit really in the last three years where anything that we made outside, you know, from the farm has all, had always gone back into infrastructure. It's just taken a lot of time, but I feel really fortunate that we're in that place now. And that I can look back on this history that I've had on this land and how many people that it's taken to build it to what it is. There's so many people that have come here, helped on this project, believed in it enough to dedicate their time to it, and then they've stayed. They're really valuable members of our community. There has been a huge community of people that have helped grow this farm from the ground to where it is now. To a point now where we're like, only paid employees, we work eight to five, we always take Sundays off, everybody gets you know a three-day weekend a month and a five-day vacation in the middle of the season and and it's just been a real progression, a real slow progression of where we started to where we are now. And that has taken a lot of people that were willing to work for $500 a month, you know, and, and live and work here and, and have that communal living and dedicated somehow to this project that I kind of had this like vision of and this dream of and I'd share it and people would be like, yeah, I want to do that. And I'd be like, awesome, let's do it. One of the huge obstacles has definitely been finances. It's been a huge stress. I worked off farm, you know, for the first five years of it and then just made the leap of faith that I'd be able to figure it out and pay the bills if I quit my job and went full-time farming and somehow I have been able to. One of the hurdles, I think, of farming this specific land is that it sits on a slope. And most farming tools or tractor implements or tractors even are made for flatland farmers. And that, you know, again, like how much flatland is in Alaska? You're gonna find it in Fairbanks and you're gonna find it in Matsu. And everybody else <laughs> is on some kind of crazy slope. So when I was introduced to the BCS Walk Behind Tractor, that really changed my farming completely. Cause I like, that can work on semi-terraced beds. My understanding of what a market garden is, is a small scale farm, usually under five acres and selling commercially. So making a living off of a plot of land, five acres or under, and John Martin Fortier in the Market Garden book that he wrote describes it really well. And his whole basis is how to be efficient, what tools to use, and how to make a living on under five acres. And our farm here is just under two acres. So we are using the bio-intensive technique of building really nutritious soils and yielding high amounts of crops off of a small amount of space to be able to make a living on it. So every inch 
within the garden fence we want to utilize. We don't want to have a spot where we need to, at the end of each row, turn a tractor around. That's too much space. It's too much valuable space. And then there's all of these new tools that are being made specifically for exactly what we're doing. A small scale farm, 30 inch beds, Every single one of our beds in the outdoor garden is 80 feet long because that's what works with our fence line. So all of our remays 80 feet long, foot long. All of our irrigation tape is 80 foot long. And all of these tools that we've been able to purchase are made to work 30 inch wide beds. So when I transform the farm to like really a willy nilly, like there's a 40 foot bed that fits over here and a 50 foot bed over here and you need to leave that remay there and that remay there, it was like everything standardized period. And we're going to build our farm to work with the tools that are coming out. And it's just like profitability, efficiency, the availability to actually make a living out of it, like changed in a year. That's the key to this career, this job. Being successful in a market garden, things that are hard to come by is money and labor and time. So if you can be efficient and profitable and work a normal work schedule, you are winning and making a living doing it. So the implementation of all of these efficiency tools is really what makes that happen. Percentage-wise, we're probably one of the most food insecure states in the United States. 95% of the food that is consumed in the state of Alaska is imported. If those supply chains get cut off, which we've seen, you know, some of that happen with the pandemic, that there's going to be a major food shortage here. We're rich. Alaska is really rich in wild harvest, wild game freshwater and saltwater fish, those kind of wild harvested foods, not everybody has the skills to do that. The majority of people in the state of Alaska, like anywhere else, are going to the grocery store to buy their sustenance. So we have a major food security issue in the state. And what I'm seeing is Homer becoming one of these agricultural hubs. We have nice fresh water, we have beautiful loam soils, we have a little bit warmer, climate than they do in northern parts of the state and we're still on the road system. So we have Homer, Fairbanks, and then the Matsu. So we have these three major hubs and it seems to me that new producers are wanting to come into these hubs and start growing. Well if we're all going to do exactly the same thing as these independent mind Alaskan farmers and you know for a living out of a small piece of land and we're all going to be at the farmers market growing the same variety of kale we're not really doing anything for the greater good we're just trying to make an independent living what I see is the next step is to work together to try to fulfill the needs of other communities and then getting into more institutions like who's feeding the hospitals who's feeding the schools who's feeding the prisons and how can we actually start to chip away at the food security issue in the state? I don't know if it's because we don't have enough producers, we don't have enough farmland, or we're not working together. If we all wanna be successful, the next step is to work together, to collaborate, to come up with a statewide system that's feeding the people of Alaska, all of the people of Alaska, whoever wants you know, access to this type of food. Something that's nagged at me, I would say for the majority of my farming career is the question, are we growing food for the upper class population? Is that who our target audience is? Is that who mainly is gonna buy our produce? Is that who can afford what we're doing? And for the most part, the answer to that is yes. There's all of this criticism in the farm to table or the sustainable food movement of it's really not affordable to 
a huge percentage of the population of the world. So, and they, even just like bringing it into the population of America, there's millions of people that can't afford locally grown produce because the ticket price is higher. So it's a big question. I don't know how to close the equity gap. I Things that we do is we, we have a community fund set up where we allow our CSA members and, and other members of the community to donate into our community fund and then that fund goes out to provide CSA shares to our women's shelter, to our food pantry, and subsidizes shares for lower income families. But that's a really tiny piece of the solution. For me, I have a lot more questions than answers. What we can do here in our small community is offer ways that family food budget dollars can extend farther, like our community fund, or we offer a dollar bin at our farmer's market booth. We can utilize awesome programs that are already in place. For example, our farmer's market has a matching dollar program that doubles the buying power of SNAP benefit holders. And as produce vendors, we can apply to be able to accept food coupons from WIC or the Senior Farmer's Market Nutrition Program. So these are some great steps to providing access. But as far as the, the big picture goes, we have a lot of work to do. Making a living on a market garden is something that's possible. I don't think it's easy necessarily, especially in the state of Alaska, but it's totally possible. And, the, and for us, we found the key to that is being efficient. And the tools that are coming out are helping with the efficiency, but also the understanding of how much can you take on. And that's something that I've really struggled with over the course of my 15 years on this project is in the beginning my mind was just like oh I can raise chickens and I can raise pigs and I can expand my garden and can do all these things but there's only labor is really expensive finding labor good labor is really hard so there's a scale there how much can you bite off as an individual or as a team of people that actually turns a profit instead of getting into so many different aspects of farming that there's holes in the bucket. Like money's leaking out over here in the chicken industry, but we're making money in the vegetables. Like for us, we had to cut the chicken industry and go right into the vegetables because that's where we could make money. So I've learned that over the years by trial and error, which is how I feel like I've learned everything. But for us, there's a, and I think often there's a sweet spot, there's a sweet size. Like we sit on nine acres of land, so our garden, just under two acres, is in an old wildflower field. Well, we could clear trees and expand the garden, but our scale is based on a four-person team. And right now, honestly, we haven't even maximized what our potential is in the acre and a half that we're growing on. I don't see that we have to grow any bigger to really make it work. So I think that there's a sweet spot. Instead of growing bigger and better, growing smarter and more efficiently and making more money at it. I often think about that question, why do we keep doing what we're doing? For me, it was a deep-rooted drive to work with the earth and grow food. And I think when contemplating that question for myself, I often have that question for other people, why do they keep, do, keep doing it, especially if they're not able to 
pay their bills and they need to seek off-farm jobs, why do they keep doing it? For me, I've asked myself that question many times and not always landing on a really direct answer, but it's the fascination that happens every single year. I think from taking a tiny seed, you know, that fits just in a pinprick of your hand and growing a 10 pound cabbage out of it, that fascination has never gone away. And hearing feedback from our customers about how delicious the vegetables are that we're producing and how much it adds to their life and to their meals and their family's nutrition, that keeps the motivation going. And on the good days when you're out there harvesting, you know, successfully 100 pounds of salad greens and we're listening to music and the sun's shining and everything's going really smoothly, those are the times that just keep, keep me going. And I think something that's maybe unique about farming is that I don't know that I'll ever master it. It's something that I learn from every single year. I know you are busy and don't need a thousand texts telling you this, but OMG, your veggies are amazing. The broccoli, basil, and zucchini this week are all ringing my chimes so hard. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all your hard work. We appreciate you every night with every lovely bite. It's messages like that that keep us going day after day. <laughs>